everybody. Welcome to Teal's Root House. In the house, Frank Ray. What's up? What's Tracy up, Lawrence, man. man. It's good do to I, see you. Do I have to call you Tracy Lawrence the whole time? No, don't call, don't use my last name. I find that really weird, man. Is it everybody TL? Says, yeah. TL, is that cool? Yeah, is that you, Tracy Lawrence? Yeah. Tracy Lawrence. Hey, Tracy Lawrence. We, we laugh about that. Do everybody, does everybody call you by your full name out on the road? You know, I, I get a lot of Frankie. It's really weird. Oh, yeah. That's weird. I don't know if it's because of the way I dress or what. I don't know. <laughs> no, yeah, I get, I get Frank. Uh, I get Mr. Ray sometimes. That's kind of cool. It makes me sound important. Uh, which I'm not, but it makes me sound like it. <laughs> yeah, it, but, uh, yeah. It, it evolves, too. It'll go, uh, they'll use your full name, and then everybody out on the road will start calling you by your initials. So, oh, yeah, 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 man. I can, yeah. That's it, man. Yeah, I'm, I'm the, I need I need something, right, because there's a lot of, you know, they got Michael Ray, you know, he's a lot more popular than I am, and uh, I always joke that I'm the, like the shorter, uglier Ray. You know, so I could use a good initial. I could use a good nickname. If you guys well, you got just, any, like you said, you need to get some some bad press. You need to stir the I pot, do, a little man. Bit, I need man. I need to stir the pot. Man. That's why I wear so these squeaky clothes. clean. That's why I wear these clothes like this. People always ask me why you dress so loud, right? Uh, a, it's just kind of my flavor, right? But uh, B, I'm not a six two white guy built like a Greek god, like Riley Green or something, man. I need to make some noise some other way. Something. So we uh, we met backstage at the Country Radio Seminar recently, and I, right. I got a chance to, to see your performance, man. I was blown away. Oh, good, man. Thank blown you. away, man. Great energy on stage. Thank Band you. was phenomenal. Just so much cool swagger. The the Latino Americana blend. I mean, so I thought Miami Sound Machine was on stage for a little bit. I was like, damn. <laughs> it, was, it was really cool. I enjoyed it, but very, very good traditional roots through it. And then I found out you're a big fan of mine. Uh, like, absolutely, yeah. man. I've been a fan of yours and shit i've been listening to country music and uh it's one of the things that turned me on to it that's one of the biggest questions i get right and you probably know that's doing interviews and stuff everyone's yeah. like who are your influences and this and that and i'm like well tracy lawrence and you know it's it's hard to you know not drop the george straits of the world and alan jackson and clint black and mark chestnut and all these guys uh but you're always at the top of the list man i appreciate the top that, of man. the list brother it's just uh it's one of those things that uh you had this really good it's this very distinct tone in your voice, and you just knew that that's Tracy Lawrence singing. Like, that's Tracy Lawrence, and then, I don't know, man, I'm a sucker for a good three, four, six, eight. Yeah, me signature too. Or whatever, man, I was like, man, this is this is where it's at. Matter of fact, when I started coming to Nashville and writing all these songs, everyone kind of knows me for this fun energy and stuff, but I was writing a lot of sad bastard songs, you know what I mean? Just And I was just like, yeah, I was trying to, I was trying to do the alibis kind of vibe yeah you know? and a lot of mine came from like early george Strait stuff you look so good in love yeah. and even john conley you know john uh, conley yeah. had some good waltzes but there's there are a lot of uh, a lot of great waltzes over the years man. Yeah, man you don't you don't hear them quite as much as you used to i think bailey zimmerman had two of them back to back off the off of his first releases man both yeah. of those were waltzes that did really well for yeah, him man. but they, they work they work they man work for but can music. you do a salsa to them uh, <laughs> 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 you can do a salsa to anything man if you have enough to drink you can do a salsa to anything so i want to i want to learn about you man yeah. I, I know you're from new mexico that's right and i know you that you used to be a police officer yes, sir. so uh your background did uh, did you grow up in new mexico what, what was your town around what were you close to major uh, city -wise? las cruces is probably the most notable right down in the southwest it's yeah borders el paso texas gotcha. so people aren't really familiar with it i usually say new mexico and they're like well how'd you get here and swam a river baby what do you think <laughs> but so you you actually uh, were were you in new mexico or just right there across the yeah. texas border really oh no, yeah so i was actually I say Las Cruces because it's it's where I spent a good chunk of my life, but I was born in Ray. I was born in Demi, New Mexico, which is about an hour west of that, as though you're going to Arizona. But if you go 30 miles south of Demi, and you hit a small town called Columbus, New Mexico, and it's that's where Pancho Villa did the raid and all that uh, stuff, and they, that's kind of their own little claim to fame. Um, uh, my aunt jokes a lot. She's like, "You're going to be our second claim to fame." I was like, "Great, that's who I want to be mentioned with." Pancho Villa, right? <laughs> Pancho, he's known for a lot of great things. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, but Columbus, New Mexico, is literally three miles north of the Mexican border, and so I fell in love with tequila pretty early on in my life. And, that's not uh, <laughs> a bad thing, man. I think tequila is a very cleansing thing. Yeah. I'm hoping that I'm going to make it as long as Willie does. Uh, I, I don't smoke like he does, but yeah. I do like my tequila. Yeah. So, man, it, maybe it just preserves you for a longer stay. Yeah, and I think tequila gets a bad rap, man. People think it's, uh, you know, it's you're, it's a shot kind of drink. I mean, it is, obviously. But if you're wincing at the end of a tequila drink, a tequila shot or something, it's not good tequila. That's just, that's a good rule of thumb. Well, the way I learned to drink bad tequila, Cuervo, uh, Jose Cuervo. 
Carvalho. Yeah, That's man. where we all start there. That's probably that, why the song started uh, coming up ahead. But one of our favorite things, uh, we had some friends of ours we used to vacation with, so we'd go to a different tropical destination. We'd usually get a house with three or four couples or whatever, and our favorite thing to do is get a bottle of Cuervo, Cuervo regular handle mix, like a handle mix, and a bottle of gold, Cuervo gold, lay in the hot tub, and do mouth mixers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Those are get you going, man. Just uh, lean your head yeah. back and bam. Yeah. <laughs> That's, shake that it off. sounds interesting. It man. was very interesting. Yeah, Only on vacation. Yeah, sounds like a fun <laughs> Tuesday night. <laughs> so, um, when did you have music in your family? Come yeah. from a musical family? No, not really. Um, I don't know where I got it from, man. Honestly, uh, I, my dad, my, my grandmother, actually tells a story that I had a an uncle named Francisco as well, right? That's my my legal name, Francisco Rey Gomez, right? But that didn't really really roll off the tongue in country music. They're like, I don't know who the hell this guy. So we went with Frank Ray. Um, but, yeah, she said he was probably the only one that was musically inclined in our family, and, and he lived down in Mexico, but, um, and he died pretty young. I don't, I don't yeah. know, it was something crazy. But so I, I assume maybe that's I, there's something in the bloodline. I don't know. Other than that, uh, my mom sang a little bit. But uh, my parents, both of them, you know, found out pretty early on that I could carry a tune. And uh, my parents split pretty young in my life, and so I, I bounced from Columbus, New Mexico, over to uh, Laredo, Texas is where my mother was originally from. And so oh. I'd go back and forth and in the summers, go back down to New Mexico and then, you know, go to school in, in Texas. And, uh, my mom really nourished my ability to sing. She'd put me in, you know, church and singing special music. And I'd gotten to choir probably around the third grade and, uh, you know, just, you know, trying to take a run of it. But there was this little girl that I had a crush on. Her name was Bianca. I remember it, right? Uh, Plain as day, because uh, that was the that was that's when the the switch kind of flipped for me, right? I got up there and sang a song, and I've been trying to get her attention for a long time. A third grade, she's crazy, right man. I've been after her for a while, uh, yeah. But yeah, um, so I was trying to get her attention. She wouldn't she wouldn't give me the time of day, and I got up there and sing a little bit. And before you know it, she wrote me a little wrote me a little love note and stuff. And I was like, that's it. I'm pl- I'm gonna be a singer now. That'll do it. I'm gonna be a singer. That's it, man. Yeah. So that's. My my earliest memory of, of of being able to sing, man, and just pursuing music, and it's been it's been great, man. It's been really really cool. So the journey from third grade. I mean, when did you? <laughs> when was the first time you stepped on stage with a full band? Oh, um, like doing country music, you mean? Just doing any down. kind of performance in front of people yeah, with I, like like with an instrument section behind you. There was a there was a, a Mother's Day like an ode to you know I did an ode to. Uh, What's the name of the song? A song for Mama is what it's called. It's a boys to men tune, and I did it in church. And I was supposed to do it by myself, but my cousins and their friends and stuff, they kind of figured out, too, the same kind of thing, same formula. Oh, you can get girls if you sing a little bit. Like, we want to jump And church on is the thing. place to pick them up. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, there was these twins at church that everyone was after. Faith and hope. Isn't that weird? <laughs> Faith and hope, hope and faith. Yeah. I said, <laughs> you I said, really can't make that. I up. said, faith and hope. Would you like a little love? <laughs> it's the greatest of them all, man. <laughs> wow. But, but yeah, so the the guys kind of jumped on with me, and and uh, I was the front man and doing the thing, and uh, man, I was hitting them notes, brother. I was I was there, you know, it was before puberty where I could do it, <laughs> and uh, and it was just cool, man. It got a lot, of, it garnered a lot of attention, and and. Uh, you know, afterwards, again, it's people that wouldn't give me the time of day were just like, I didn't know you could sing like that. And I said, well, strap in, baby. we got some more. So were you, did the dream kind of start in that yeah. kind of era, yeah. area when you decided that you really wanted to do it? Was it country that was on top of your list, or were you still trying to figure out exactly where you wanted to No, yeah, to country has always been at the top of my list. Yeah. But, you know, making the mixtapes and all that stuff, I'd, I'd do a bit of both, right? I'd go to, you know, Y100 or KG97 down in San Antonio, and I would, you know, make a little mixtape and then, hop over to the pop station and, uh, you know, get all the Usher stuff. Like, what's going to give me the girls? What's going to give me the girls? And that's that's pretty much it, man. It's, it's safe to say that's always kind of been my, my driving factor, at least early on. Right? I understand. That, that changed. That so changed I'm sure you, you probably did. I'm bringing sexy back a couple times. <laughs> yeah, exactly, <laughs> which I wasn't. I, I don't look like Justin Timberlake, but I was bringing like a mediocre sexy back. <laughs> yeah, I was bringing, yeah, yeah, whatever. I got I got two moves, my wife. My poor wife. <laughs> no, but I, I think that's part of. That's I know we're getting. On, we're getting we'll get back on. My track. wife's going to listen to this. She's like, "What are you well, doing, we'll cut Frank? That out. What are you going to do?" <laughs> no, it's uh, it's that's really where the journey started, man. It's just uh, I wanted to perform, and you know that was my first real taste of it out in church, and then uh, you know choir, and we did that whole thing, and I found myself getting more lead roles and and things like that, and um, and then I I I tried to write, you know, early on. My mom's probably got some 
you know, papers somewhere. I, I don't know what it is, but where I tried to, it's the worst songs you could probably ever think of. But, um, you know, I was trying, man. I, I always had an itch for it. But country music, you know, I don't have to tell you, man. You just fall in love with it. You fall in yeah. love with the storytelling. It's the one thing that separates this genre from everything else, right? Yep. You're not looking for the rhyme, per se. You're looking for the storyline and how do you really best serve the hook. And and that's where I really got interested in it. Uh, you know, fast forward to my law enforcement career. I mean, music got put in the back burner, you know, for, for the better part of 10 years. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, was that uh, family issues, responsibility that kind of pushed you down that path or just, uh, did you have family that was in law enforcement? No, no. Yeah. It's just, that's pretty much it. I, 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 uh, I was working a bunch of odd jobs, right? I, I did everything, man. I was a, I was in retail and I was a, a, a busser down at Chili's and, and, uh, I slang cell phones for a little bit with the cricket. <laughs> if you yeah. guys are looking for a good cell phone, <laughs> it was like, uh, it was just crazy. I did all these things because college didn't work out for me. I did a semester of that, and I was like, this sucks, dude. I don't want to do this. Yeah. This is not good. And, um, yeah, I just kind of found myself lost for a little bit. And uh, the girl I was dating at the time, her dad was a uh, lieutenant at the county jail in Deming. And uh, he, you know, he got me an interview, and I, I went in there, and I did that for about 11 months. But, you know, at that, at that age, I was 19 years old. And, uh, you know, they're just like, you take a mop. We'll give you a badge, but you clean the halls. You know, that's, that's your job. And I was like, I don't want to do this. Yeah. Uh, but in that 11 months, I made some, a lot of good friends that would come in, you know, on the, on the police side and, you know, they'd start talking to me, Frank, you got to jump over to this side, man. It's a lot more fun. And, uh, you know, I, a couple of weeks later, I found myself applying for the Las Cruces police department and, you know, they needed cops. So I got in, man. And it seemed like I blinked and 10 years went by. You know, I didn't. I'm not not going to go deeply down this path, but it it breaks my heart to see uh, how law enforcement's being treated around the country oh, right man, now. Yeah. I don't feel as much here in Nashville, uh, but you know, it it there are some some spots. But uh, uh, I think when you lose the rule of law, your society's breaking down. Right. I really am afraid for where we're at with what I see going on around the country. Yeah, man, it's unfortunate, and that's the reason why we we try to keep really close ties to that community. I mean, I, I will back law enforcement and first responders till the day I die. There's a, yeah. And it's not a political thing for me. It's always been a human thing, right? You have the sense of law and order, but at the end of the day, because I walked a mile in those shoes, I know what it's like, you know, and, 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 I, and I dealt with some really human elements of, of the job, and that's what people forget, and I, I will never forget that. I know that there's a there's a man or a woman putting on that uniform every day, going out to, you and, know, get and the some of them aren't going home to see their families. Exactly, right? and exactly. that's scary. And there's there's good and bad in everything. You know, there sure. are bad cops, yeah. and but but we have an opportunity, to, and especially in this business, you get to meet a lot of the really good ones out as we travel that do security at venues and yeah. you know all over the country. And it's a very honorable profession that doesn't. Uh, there's more downside than there is upside. It's yeah. definitely a passion that that calls you to do that walk of life. Oh yeah, absolutely. Once I, I mean, I got in at 20 years old, and I became a part of a family that was so much bigger than I ever thought yeah. I'd jump into and that is really what changed it for me um so it's yeah you can all the stuff that you see on the media and all this stuff it just it paints it paints police officers in a really bad light but uh the fact of the matter the, the vast majority of them are really really good people Absolutely. and they got bills they got families they got troubles of their own man sometimes yep. bills they can't pay you know because they get paid shit um and so so yeah I know the the human element that, that goes into that and that's what I think we need to do to try to get people to come back around and, and respect law enforcement, uh, not for, you know, not only for the job that they're doing, but because of the human being that they are. Yeah, and it's sad to see that that uh, uh, we have a generation of kids growing up with total dis disrespect for the law and yep. authority, and uh, I think we're going to be dealing with that for a long time. I agree, it's man. I agree. I think that's what we're kind of using this platform for now is uh, if, you know, people, fans of mine and stuff, uh, whether they're on the fence on law enforcement or first responders or whatever the case may yeah. be, um, my whole thing is to change that narrative. Um, and be because I have this platform, I have a bigger microphone, right? And, and I think we could do that. We could do it. It's going to take some time, but I mean, yeah, I think we can band together and, and really have a, you know, a good conversation about it. At least, uh, at least, uh, open the minds of people back up to the realities of the struggle that officers go through and the dangers that they face every day yeah. and, and have a little bit more respect and appreciation for the shoes that they wear, you know? Yeah, absolutely, man. And, and without jumping too far ahead, I mean, we started an organization called Frey, 
uh, which is it caters specifically to first responders and their mental wellness, right? And and I've been going out while I'm while I've been on tour. I visit police departments, I visit firehouses, I I visit everybody that I can. We were just out with the Coast Guard um, in Key West and, and down with the the Key West Police Department as well. And yeah. um, you know, we talk about this mental wellness thing because mental health is sort of a thing that it's a really taboo sort of subject, especially when it comes to, uh, you know, these alpha males, right? These, uh, type A personalities where you say mental health and it's a fucking eye roll, man. They're just like, oh, I don't want to talk about yeah, this. Yeah, but it's a real thing, but man. It's a real thing. And when, when I think it's, it's received a lot better when it comes from somebody who's walked a mile in those shoes. And I'm like, dude, I know you're full of shit, man. Cause I know the stuff that keeps me up at night and, and, and I know you're dealing with it too. Yeah. And, uh, I know from going through some traumatic experiences too, uh, at a time when, when, you know, you're young and cocky and don't think you need yeah. to, to, to get, someone to talk to to kind of ease sure. and I struggled with it for a long time yeah uh, and I, I don't think uh, I, I think people look at it with different eyes now than what they used to it's a much yeah. more common thing and there's there's better terminology that breaks it down into more individual groups it's not PTSD I mean 20 30 years ago you never knew what that was really? but it's a very real exactly. thing and and it can be brought on by getting caught in a, 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 a brawl or a car wreck or, or get shot at or just yeah. all these different things family drama I mean it, and it can linger on on you for a long long time if you don't get the help you need yeah and uh you know, police officers are notorious for compartmentalizing stuff, right? We just like because we're we have this. You have to have this sort of command ego. presence, yeah. right? You got to have this machismo about you. You got to be like nothing bothered me, right? Um, and but the truth of the matter is that uh, that that shit needs to go somewhere. And and a lot of times they'll find themselves in either alcohol or substance abuse or find themselves in domestic violence issues. I've had a lot of buddies that have lost their jobs because of that, because of that stuff. Um, and, you know, ultimately, you know, some of them take their own lives. And that's the stuff that we're trying to prevent. And, yeah. and that's the stuff that people don't really see. They don't really understand that. I mean, I talk to my manager, Oscar, and tell him some of the war stories that I've got. And he's just like, holy crap. Because at the time, as, as the general public just looks at you as, hey, you're just a cop. You know, like you're supposed to go out there. You're supposed to do these things. Absolutely. Right. But but you got to take that shit home. You know, and you got to oh, yeah, do something you, with it. You, you've got to do something with it. And most people, especially men, uh, with our, our egos and everything, you just kind of shove it down yeah, and, yeah. and put your pants back on the next day and go out, have a few drinks at the end of the day, yeah. and you just keep moving forward. Yeah. And at some point, it's going to come out, and, and that anger is going to explode on somebody. Yeah. At some situation, it's inevitable. It's going to happen. It's a ticking time bomb. Exactly. And so I talk about it. Like, if there's anybody that we want to have the, the best mental clarity is police officers, right? Those are the people that you call when nobody ever calls 911 when things are going great. You know what I mean? I've never gotten a call that you're like, hey, Frank, how's your day going? Great, man. Well, see you later. Toodaloo. <laughs> Just hang up. It's never been that. It's always been when the worst day of their life, shit's hitting the fan, yeah. and, and somebody's got to do that job. So we got to make sure we're taking care of the people that, that, uh, that take care of the community. And so we started Frey with that goal in mind to kind of be a hub to, to farm, you know, first responders, you know, in the right direction of organizations that already exist. SAMHSA, uh, COPS is a great hotline, all suicide prevention stuff. Um, and where can really they go to that? Do you have a website? Yeah, or yeah, the website's up stuff? and running. It's all okay. still in its developmental phases, but the website, we wanted to make sure that, that was uh, good to go. Um, but it's all, it, it's frayoc.org. It, it's awesome. F-R-A-Y-O-C.org. They can go check it out and, uh, you know, get the help they need. And, again, it's it's catered specifically for first responders. But mental health has been a thing that is a, it's now a more socially acceptable conversation, like you, yeah. like you said, uh, in mainstream pop culture. Right? We just need to kind of get that energy and, and, and put it to the people that really, really need it, you know. So, Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, from that 10-year stretch, when did you start saying, man, i got to get back to where my passion's at? Well, When did you hit the off-ramp and make a change? It was probably about – uh, five or six years in, and it was a l large in part because of that. Like, I had a lot of stuff that was kind of weighing on me, and I needed to find a healthy outlet to do it. Yeah. Uh, and music was always it. And that's not to say that uh, music was always on the back burner uh, because I was focused on trying to be the best cop that I could possibly be. Uh, but, I mean, it, it, it was still there. Like, I had a little punk rock band with a couple cousins of mine. We were... Uh, we were terrible, man. It was terrible. It was absolutely terrible. Uh, but Do we, we have video? Oh, I'm sure there's some stuff. The, 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 band, the band was called Cadence. And it was, it was, oh, uh, Jimmy, see if you can find Cadence. Oh, God. It's so <laughs> bad, man. Uh, I'm sure I can find some stuff, and I'll, I'll, uh, my cousin probably awesome. has all that stuff. Um, awesome. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, we, we did, like, warp Tour, like, played in little side stages out there and stuff. We tried we tried everything, and, and then uh, I 
again, I did law enforcement and, and I just got back to say, man, I really want to write country music. That's always been where my heart is. Uh, so I picked up a guitar one day and I mean, I knew a few chords because uh, in Cadence, we were just doing a bunch of power chords, right? You don't even have to know music at that point. You put everything in drop D and just rock. You, this, 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 it's this fret, this fret, this fret. Um, but I, you know, first song I learned how to play was uh, Friends in Low Places. And so I was just like, it was kind of easy, right? Let me do that. And I started playing that. And I was like, all right, I think I'm going to start up a country band now. <laughs> I know Friends in Low Places. That's all I need. Uh, that second chord, you know. <laughs> I know. It's, I don't <laughs> even know what work. it is. I just know the fingers go here. Um but I, I I called my same cousin up that was uh that played bass for me in, in that punk rock band. I said, "Hey man, I'm gonna do country music now. You want to play bass for this thing?" He's like, "Yeah, absolutely." And then uh we found a couple other buddies, and uh, on my days off at that point, I had gained enough seniority where I had Thursday, Friday, Saturday off, and I was on day shift, and so I could do it. I could hit all the honky tonks in, yeah. in our region, and that's what we started doing. So you know, by day I was a cop, and by nightfall, I was out there in the honky tonks, man, just playing music, and it was really cool. And I'd written some stuff, but of course, we were pretty cover heavy, and um, we had a pretty good reaction. I'd see some people in the crowd that I'd arrested, and I knew we were onto something good because they didn't want to kick my ass. Instead, so they <laughs> they bought me a shot. They're pretty good, man. I'm sorry for being a jackass the other time. I was like, ah, it's all right, man. It's cool. We're all there. We've all been there, man. I'm sure I'll get there tonight, but have a few tequila <laughs> shots. Uh, but it was that, that's kind of what started the whole thing, man. And and uh, that band was called Border Avenue. And there's definitely some stuff about there. Uh, but Border Avenue was a thing, um, and and we gained some pretty good notoriety in our town and. Um, Oscar was working with another artist in, in El Paso and they had made some trips up to Nashville and, and Oscar being the guy that he is, he was like, man, why is there like in Nashville, it seems like to be a pretty tight knit community, right? They, they do all the writers rounds and stuff and everyone's got pretty good relationships. There's really no animosity here. It's, it's always friendly. It's competition. And over there, it's always animosity. Oh, I'm better than, you know, you're trying to be the king of the hill over there and you know, because there are only so many bars that you can play. Yeah. So it, there was a lot of animosity there. And so Oscar was just like, why don't we get together and have a little writer's round with the, the you know, the notable artists in, in the region. And so we got together with a couple of buddies and, and uh, some of the guys heard heard some of my music and they turned me on to Oscar and they said, hey, you got to keep your eye out on this guy. I know you're trying to do some stuff over here with this artist in, in, in Texas, but you got to, you know, don't go to sleep on this guy, Frank. And, and, uh, you know, he, he said, man, I, I think you got something special. Let's work together. So I went over and talked to the Border Avenue guys. And at that point, we had just won a battle of the bands uh, for a slot, uh, for uh, an opportunity to, to play uh, an opening slot for Keith Urban was passing through. And we won. And so we got that opportunity. That was my first time getting that kind of tour production, and the big stage and the lights. At the time, he was on tour. Uh, Were Mar- you direct Mar- support right in front of him? Yeah, or? right in front of him. Yeah, uh, Marin Morris was the one that was direct support for him. So we kind of got that whole lighting rig and stuff, and she yeah. wasn't there. He was just passing through, so it was kind of a one-off for him. Um, but I got out there, man. I got to play in front of 8,000 people that night, and I was like, oh, this is it. This is it. This is what I want, man. I got to play original songs and stuff. I wasn't a, I wasn't a bar band at that point anymore. I was like, this is... This is where the artistry starts, and and as luck would have it, uh, all the Border Avenue guys were, uh, you know, buying houses and looking to get married and looking to settle down in Las Cruces. And I was like, we ought to move to Nashville. And they're like, you're out of your damn mind, man. We're not going to do that. Like we, you know, I just got, I just got, I just picked up a mortgage. <laughs> and so it was, it was tough to convince these guys to to take that leap. And uh, they gave me their blessing and said, man, if you got an opportunity to work with this guy Oscar, you should, you should do it. And so I called them up and I said, hey, man, I. I think uh, I think we should work together. And he's like, let's do it, man. Um, so we did that for a little bit. Same kind of thing. Started the Frank Ray project, and we went out to Sonic Ranch uh, Studios out in Tornillo, Texas, and recorded uh, six songs. And, man, we got it done quick. We were in the studio probably like two days um, with the band that I have now. And uh, started hitting the Texas Regional Radio circuit and doing that whole thing and had That's, some pretty good success. Yeah, you, you had uh, – how many singles did you put out on the I Texas put, charts? Three, yeah, four. I put four out. The first one we put out was a song called "Every Time You Run." That went uh, number nine, and that was a big deal for us. We're like, "Oh shit!" Right, now you can work the. Re- you can work your whole life in Texas. I mean, Randy oh, yeah. Rogers is my friend. Oh, I mean, yeah. you know, I've known Pat and Green, a lot of those guys. Yeah, Kevin Fowler and all of them that came through that. But what you have something. Uh, bilingual, everything. I mean, I remember Freddie Fender. You know, yeah. uh, there were uh, uh, golly, there was a few guys early on. What was his name? Um, God. Johnny that, Rodriguez is another I love, one. I love Johnny Rodriguez, Rod, man. I got Rod's to spend good. a lot of time with Rodriguez uh, when I first got to Nashville in the 90s. Rodriguez, whew, he's 
He comes with his challenges, man. Yeah, he does. Right, the, Johnny's got some baggage. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. if you listen, if you go back and listen to uh, uh, the the original record of how Cowgirl says goodbye, yeah. <laughs> I did my very best Rodriguez voice. <laughs> that's that's me doing my Rodriguez phrasing on that record. No kidding, really man. Is, that's man. Go really back and cool. listen to it. You can I hear, will. You can hear the little nuances, man, because yeah. I stole some stuff from Johnny. That, me and him, me and him, drank a few things together over the years. <laughs> but he bless his heart, he went through a lot. Yeah. And Rick Trevino. Rick, Rick Trevino was another one. Emilio Nevada. You know, the late Emilio Nevada was another one, man. He was kind of the, the Tejano act and he was, you know, he was set to have a pretty good career in country music, and then you know he passed so, away. So, so uh, as as far as blending things, uh, that I, I've been blessed to have a huge following along the border from McAllen, El Paso, all through there. And I don't think that's as easy for a lot of traditional hat singers to do. I mean, yeah. some people hit, some people don't. It's not something you either have a connection or you don't. It's really strange. That's it. Uh, but but have do you have the aspirations of, of working and and below the border quite a bit i mean yeah. you have an opportunity to really bridge a gap here that that Absolutely. we haven't seen anybody do in a long time oh yeah man our goal has always been to to sell out estadio azteca right in mexico city it's yeah. like 100,000 seats man I, I know it's a big goal but why not you know why not shoot for that kind oh, of oh man absolutely goal? so that's sort of our thing and um and i think that was some of the appeal with the record label now just like the knowing that a the Hispanic demographic consumes country music, you know, absolutely a lot more than people think. Yeah. Uh, and it, and it's it's always growing; it's constantly growing. Uh, and so I think it's important to have that representation in in country music, and and you know, it hasn't been there for shit the last twenty thirty years almost. Been there so. a few people, but no, nobody people. that really popped exactly. And and uh, you're on Broken Bow, right? You're, That's right. Yeah, are? Broken Bow. Yeah. And so Loba seems to have a good grasp and a good vision of being able to step outside of the boundaries of the typical norm of what we expect out of Nashville, like Jelly and other people yeah. that he's working with. And that's good to see. How much uh, how much control are you having in the studio? With have, you got a full project oh, done? You got yeah. your I've listened yeah. to three or four years. Yeah, we do. Yeah, we do. And I'm really excited about it because it's 15 songs uh, that we cut. Uh, we put with the Get You Some EP. We put we took six songs that we thought were the, the best snapshot of what the album is going to sound like. So it's a little bit of everything. You have some stuff that sounds traditional country. You got some stuff like Country Look Good on You that's a little more in the R&B world. Um, how, how did you structure those sessions? Did you do part of it with session players? Some of it sounded pretty Nashville, but I know that you have the the other side. That, are you using part of your, your road band and things? No, no, no. Um, and, and mainly because when we started incorporating like percussion and stuff like that, I mean, the, you know, these session players are so incredible. They can do Absol- it all, man. Absolutely. And everyone's got, you know, influences from every, anywhere. So if you tell Brian Sutton, who's a, a traditional like bluegrass player, like, hey, man, can you do some more like, Carlos Santana licks. He's like, Absolutely. I got you. Didn't and Brent Mason, any of them, you can give any them direction. Them. And they, they, they have studied all the different disciplines, and they have them down to an art. It's amazing. Yeah, and I, and I really feel like when I came to Nashville and started writing, you know, Frank Rogers kind of took me under his wing, and uh, over at Spirit and Music Nashville and Fluid uh, Music Revolution, is my, they're my publishers, kind of a joint venture. Um, but he was just like, well, let's let's see what you got. And um, he you know, started playing a couple songs, and he's like, well, you, you got some potential. Hit songs not not there yet, but... If you work with us for a little bit, we'll, we'll find it. Um, and, and we did. So I really found my voice. And uh, taking that time to kind of build these relationships and getting to know people, that's really what separates, uh, you know, the good songs from the great songs. It, it, when, when somebody knows you that well, they know the style that you're looking for and uh, they know what's what you shouldn't waste time on. Like, this is not your vibe. Let's not waste time on it. And, and what you should, you know, spend your, your, your time and energy on it. And uh, we did that. And so we went in there and... and, and we had 15 songs that we had selected out of the hundreds that I wrote over COVID. And it was just like, all right, cool. We, we got a good project that, that I'm really, really proud of. And um, But to that point, I've always had that bit of a different sound. And so I don't know that Texas Red Dirt Country scene was ever going to work well for me. Um, and so after all that, just kind of go back to what we were talking about, uh, doing the Texas scene was working for me with these songs. I had a couple number ones on, on Texas country radio. Uh, and it got to the point where I really couldn't balance it with the law enforcement gig anymore. I mean, I was yeah. showing up late to work it or calling in. I'm just like, man, I'm over here in Beaumont. I, I can't make it to briefing Sunday at six thirty in the morning. Um, Texas is a big ass state. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I was like, I can't, I can't make it. And, uh, you know, sat down with some of my supervisors and they're just like, this is what you want to do. We all know it. Everyone sees it. And the chief of police would walk through the hallways and, 
look at me and said, Frank, you're still here? And I was like, yeah. And he's like, why don't you get out of here, man? Go do what you want to do. And uh, that's really all it took. So I, I talked to Oscar and I said, man, I, I'm thinking about quitting my job. And, uh, you know, as my manager, that's probably a lot to put on his plate. But also at the same time, he's got a lot of great business savvy. So he was like, man, if you, if you do that, um, you know, I don't want to promise you anything, but it opens up the door for me to do what I need to do as a manager and get you into places and all this stuff. And I said, well, let's go, man. Let's go get it. My wife gave me her blessing, and, and that was pretty much it. And so we started playing more around the Texas scene, but dipping our foot in Nashville and, you know, coming over here and just showing up to parties we probably had no business being a part of, man. We just knew somebody who was yeah. going to, like, a number one party, and we'd show up there like, hola, que pajo, que pasó, amigos, como estamos? And they're just like, who the hell are these Mexicans? What's going on, man? Uh, and it was just, that's sort of what we did uh, until the point where we were showing our face enough that it, it garnered some some you know intrigue and then we started putting on showcases and stuff out here and and for you know something you know somebody liked what we were doing let's let's dive into strategy a little bit because we've the hell is that the, the, <laughs> i, mean, I don't have a plan oh you know you got a plan <laughs> no. you're smart i can tell man so so you know an entry level album you got 15 songs how uh how have you divided the styles up on the record? Uh heavy country, heavy Latino, what what's the mix of things on the record? And I ask this because I want to talk about your five year plan because an artist like you has to come in knowing exactly who you are and exactly where you want to go because the label can only take what you give them to work with. So you have to really be the point of light at the top of that spear. Yeah. So, so so let's walk me through where you're at with that and what you see down the road. Well, like I, like I mentioned before, part of that appeal, I think, from the from the label was what can we bring with Latin influence? Yes. What's going to differentiate us, right? So we knew we wanted to do that. But at the same time, man, I grew up as a 90 country baby. Like, I, I didn't want to veer too far in the direction that it became unfamiliar and not known as country music now. Country music has evolved in such a way now that you can really kind of stretch the bounds, uh, the boundaries a little bit. Uh, but we, we definitely wanted to... We wanted to, I wanted to emulate what you would see at a live performance, right? So you can hear some chicken picking country music, right? Traditional stuff. And then all of a sudden we take you on this little journey. And before you know it, you're in this really heavy Latin kind of salsa kind of vibe. Yeah. And then we bring it back down to a little ballad, right? That it's very family oriented and this and that. And then we bring it back up with a party. And uh, it's just a matter of kind of. Uh, finding a good flow with that whole thing and that's what we're doing with the album so we selected all these songs and we structured every song to say from start to finish if someone was going to listen to this by by the end of it do they they'll know exactly who i am as an artist and and who i am as a person and, and what they're what they're going to get at a live show um and so yeah there's some latin stuff in there there's some like I said, I used to listen to Usher and Boys to Men and all that stuff. There's definitely that flavor in there as well. I listen to you yeah. a lot, so you can you find some sad bastard songs in there too. But uh, you know, and, <laughs> and I see from a marketing standpoint too, man. There's 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 such an opportunity, yep. you know, to, to do full Latin versions of of the hits that you have on the American charts. Yep. I don't really know how radio is structured in Mexico. How can do, how's it structured? Is it more like Europe, where everything is programmed like a television station, or do they have dedicated formats? They have dedicated formats. Okay. Uh, it's still kind of a little more of the Wild West. I think there's yeah. more room for freedom there, right? It's not super syndicated to the point where just like, hey, this is your playlist, play this, and that's it. Yeah. If they hear something they like, they'll play it. Uh, we did that with a song called Streetlights, and uh, you know, it, it, had, it made a little movement down there. Um, but at the same time, unless you have a full-blown plan to go and hit that market you know, with, with 100% full gusto, it really makes no sense to release yeah. anything out there. Um, Unless you're unless you're gonna go unless you're gonna go support it, yeah. exactly yeah unless you're gonna go and do the radio tour down there and do all that stuff and really right now I thought it was important to focus our efforts here and and and, and keep building a career here Absolutely. so that we have that thing Absolutely. Uh, yeah. but yeah it's been it's been pretty interesting to, to see this whole thing play out and, and put it all together and structure it in a way that makes sense we're not beating anybody over the head and waving the Mexican flag saying listen to me because I'm Mexican oh, yeah. right it's nothing like that I want people to listen to the song and be like. I love this song, and then go and find me. You're like, oh shit, the guy's oh, Mexican. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, and and I understand that. And, and yeah. believe me, I, you you have an amazing voice. You have a great stage presence. Your band's badass. Thank you. Uh, so I mean, I just see such a huge opportunity for you to have an amazing career that breaks down a lot of boundaries. I and I haven't that. seen anybody like that here in a long time. Man, and that's what we're trying to accomplish. And it's not lost on me either. And I think that's yeah. what's really cool about hitting this stride in my career now that I you know I was in my 30s at. Uh, 
uh, when I first started coming to Nashville, and it was just like now I, I got to get head on my shoulders. I'm not the punk ass kid that I was back in the day, but uh, but I I I have the right team. We all yeah. share the same ambition. We all share the same vision of what we're trying to accomplish. I got the right record label. Uh, we got the right songs. Um, it's just a matter of of connecting. That's all, you know. And so um, when you got uh, when you were told that you made the new faces show, man, how'd that feel? Man, I gotta tell you, that was really, really funny. So I never get calls from the higher ups in the in the label, right? That Oscar gets those. He 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 feels those calls. Yeah. Uh, but I was I was uh, so ironically enough making tacos that night, and my, house, and my wife, yeah, dude, all the stereotypes they're true. Brother. You just keep throwing them out there, man. They're true, brother. I I ain't gonna shy away from it, man. That's that's some true shit. I was making tacos that night, and uh, and my wife was trying to get us a new healthcare plan, but she was logged in on my phone because I have all the passwords and stuff. And so she was doing all that stuff, and, and, and uh, Carson James was calling, and Adrian Michaels was calling. These guys were the higher-ups, right, the VPs of, uh, of the label, and, and she was just ignoring them, like, uh, well, decline, decline, because she didn't want to get kicked out of the portal again, right? Yeah. <laughs> and so she was doing that, and uh, after all that happened, I went and, you know, you know, set the table and stuff. She's oh, by the way, this guy called you, and I was like, Oh shit! What did I do wrong? What's on TMZ right now? What's going on? <laughs> what is happening? Uh, I answered the phone and and uh, they put me like on a conference call sort of thing, and then they gave me the news, and I ran around the house like crazy, man. I, and I and I opened up a bottle of tequila. I'm telling you, that I, I was blessed enough to be on the New Faces show back in '92, and had a huge class. They they've narrowed it down. Uh, I, I really don't even remember how many songs we got to do, but I think the set was much shorter because. There's like eight or nine different artists. I know I was on there with Brooks and Dunn, with Little Texas, with Pam Tillis. Uh, I think Sammy Kershaw was on that. There was like, a, and every there was only one guy out of that whole class that didn't pop, and his name was Eddie London. Uh-huh. And Eddie sang great, man. He he sounded just like Merle Haggard when Haggard was young. Yeah, but he couldn't get out of his own way. Yeah, he was he was the only one. Everybody else in that class, and I remember just being so nervous getting on that stage, but seeing how it's condensed down. I think we had five acts this year. Uh, it was it was really such a diverse class of artists that I was just blown away the diversity you got Priscilla Block you got you you got Jelly Roll I mean it was just it was an amazing night I was really blown away by by what I see as the future of country music right there we saw it as uh as our Super Bowl you know what I mean it was just like this is a an opportunity that you can't let go to waste and and performing first I was the first one out there and I was just like that was racist set to bar baby (laughs) why'd you guys put the Mexican first that was racist no I'm kidding uh but no it was one of those things where Oscar and I talked about I talked about with my team and i was like man i want a full brass section if i can get them um i want a percussionist and uh we're gonna do our country stuff i said we all want to get mexican brother hold my beer let's go well you know what i mean and I, that was I, sort of the thing i thought your your stage presence i mean uh, the, all great performances but i thought you i thought you stole the show oh, I, I thought you that, stole man. the night man Thank i was you, man. absolutely blown away by by it goes back to what you said about the how you put your record together about the pace and the transition and trying to get this and then you got to make the moves from the right song to the next song right. you did that very well that appreciate night that. Thank uh you. how many of those folks on stage are uh, is the band that you're carrying with you right now um it, we're a six-piece band uh my Myself included. Uh, so the percussionist was a guy named Yamil. Um, and he, we, we just uh, Oscar. I don't know. I don't know where he found him, man. He probably found him on Nolansville Road somewhere. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, he found, he found Yamil. He never stops. Does he? I don't, man. Yeah, I don't, man. Uh, but Yamil was actually um, he was actually a cop too. So we hit it off right yeah. right away, man. He was a cop for uh, oh, shit. I forget, man. Ten years too, probably 10, yeah. 15 years. Uh, and the same thing. He's like, I want to be a percussionist. This is what I want to do, man. And uh, so he he you know he left his job here recently and and was out there. So I thought it was a really good opportunity. And I said, you got some dancers, and he's got some dancers. And cool, you got anybody that plays horns? He said, we got some people that play horns. And man, this is a one stop shop, baby. This guy's got everything. So we brought those those guys in. So it's probably four other people. The the, the three uh, uh, brass in the brass section, and then Yamil on percussion, and then we had some dancers come out and stuff. And uh, it was just a, a really cool opportunity for us to be able to showcase what we can do. Um, and and I, I think that was important, right? They're like, this guy's not only country, but he, you're, to your point, you can break down barriers and, and you can really um, step into different worlds or bring those other worlds into country music. Yep. It's just a really cool opportunity. What did uh, what was the hardest transition uh, for you uh, 
being Texas artist to Nashville, what do you, what were the differences that you saw music wise? I mean, structure wise, yeah. the industry. I mean, that's that's a. It may not seem that much from the outside of looking in, but it's a drastic step musically and a drastic step business wise too. Yeah, I think, uh, man, honestly, because there's such a divide, there's such a gap between those two worlds, uh, just from Texas red dirt country and, and Nashville, and there's always this whole, you know, I don't know why there's this, all this animosity, right? Uh, but but there is, and my biggest fear was just like, man, the fans that we developed in Texas already, what are they going to think of me if I go to Nashville? They can. I mean, yeah. Pat, Pat Green felt it. Yeah, and yeah. it's just one of those things. They start calling you a sellout or whatever. But luckily, I was early on in my career where I didn't think I had that kind of a impact, right, where they could oust me, right? I wasn't a Randy Rogers or a Wade Bowen or, yeah. you know, these guys, Kyle Park, uh, you know, where if I made that jump um, – you know, fans would hate me, and the fans that were there were already pretty loyal, and they're just like, they kind of knew that sonically I, I sounded a little bit different, so it wasn't that big of a leap, but there was that thing that was kind of weighing in the back of my mind, like, man, what am I going to lose some people here? Like, what are we going to do, start from scratch? I don't know, but it was just one of those things, you kind of bet on yourself, man. Yep. You bet on yourself, and... How, how, how... Uh... How was the move to Nashville? Were you, were you intimidated by it? Had you been here several times before? Yeah, right. I think that's what made it easier is that we Oscar and I had been coming to Nashville uh, on our own dime um, probably for the better part of a year and a half, uh, and we'd come every month for a couple weeks, yeah. um, and which also helped set up my time on the road and stuff with my family. And she, my wife's just like, all right, man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do Easter without you. Uh, but it was just one of those things where we, we put in the time, right? We put in the effort and we came to Nashville and we'd write and we'd go back and uh, come back and write and, and meet people and go out and have drinks and just network. And it was just ba- like every month we were coming to the point where we got the record deal. And um, all of a sudden I signed in February of 2020. And I was set, I actually had a flight set to come to Nashville and meet everybody on the team, this and that, and the world shut down. Yeah. And I was like, well, well luckily I already signed the contract, man. I got you, bitch. We're, <laughs> we're, <laughs> we're in, man. You, you, I signed on the dotted line and so did you. So what are we going to do now? And at that point, nobody knew what to do. So it was just a matter, it was kind of a silver, like a silver lining, a blessing in disguise where uh, at that point I only had about five songs to pitch to the label. And so I just started writing. We did all the Zoom stuff, and yeah. you know, if it, it was safe enough, a couple of buddies of mine from Spirit, uh, Frank Rogers, Jeremy Bussey, Monty Criswell, Derek George, and Bobby Hamrick, we all got together and went to South Carolina and just kind of secluded ourselves in a little beach house there and, and wrote, and we just wrote and wrote and wrote, and that's how I stockpiled all these songs. So now when, it's, when the world started to kind of open up again, we can go to the label and be like, hey, you know those five songs I showed you? Well, listen to these. Yeah. You know, These are kind of more the vibe of what we're looking for. And... Uh, so it was a really a, a big blessing in disguise. It, it really allowed me to kind of stockpile songs and really find my voice. And, uh, you know, September of 2020 is when my wife and I decided to move to Nashville. I was like, well, the world shut down. No one's doing a damn thing. Let's just let's rent a truck. It was so bad that when we called and rented a truck, we were like, do you have anything available? They're like, we have everything available, man. No one's doing <laughs> anything. And I was like, okay, cool. So I was supposed to have the truck back, like, um, two days prior to when we actually turned it in, I called back. I was like, hey, I'm going to need an extension. They're like, just keep it. We're not going to charge you extra. Just bring it whenever and leave it in the parking lot of the Home Depot. Put the key on the left front <laughs> yeah, tire. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. That was pretty much it. Yeah, and so that was. Uh, it was just one of those things where we weren't under the gun for anything, so the pressure of having to get here by a deadline was, you know, the weight was off our shoulders. We just took our time getting up here, man. It was, it was, uh, it was uh, pretty easy to make that transition. And uh, so – how many dates are you doing this year? Are you out with somebody or just out there grinding it out? Yeah, well, a little bit of both, man. We're out with Old Dominion right now. Cool. Um, yeah. That started in uh, beginning of January, so we hit that tour with them. Um, it's it's a, It's been postponed a little bit because Matt Ramsey, the front man of Old Dominion, he was in an ATV accident and broke his hip uh. Uh, in three different places, so we hope he gets well soon, man, because we want to get back out there. Um, but, yeah, man, we're, we're, we're on the road with them. we got several dates slotted with them still. Uh, well into I guess into July, but you know other than that, festival season's here. Yeah, we got all the clubs that we like to play and stuff. We're probably going to rack up about two hundred fifty shows this year. Whew. Yeah, that's a lot, dude. It's a lot. Uh, it is a lot, man. I, I, that gives me anxiety. <laughs> dude, my me first, too. Why my, do you think I drink so much? Uh, my first year on the road, I remember a lot of two days, but we did two hundred eighty nine shows. My Oof. first year. 
I mean, that, and, and it's it's a staggering number of dates, and I don't know how I survived it. I literally, I didn't tell, I, I booked a trip to Hawaii, and I didn't even tell anybody I was leaving. Since that last date, I left and didn't tell anybody where I was. I just disappeared. <laughs> I was fried. Yeah. You know, it's a, that's a that's a heavy burden, man. It is, man. It's, it's, really it's a lot, is. man. It's, it's a lot. lot. It's, it's, it's one of those things that people, especially with social media now, like, you know, you get all the highlights and stuff, and it's all a good time. Um but it does weigh on you. Talk and it about weighs it. on your marriage too. Oh I mean, yeah, it, man, it, it does. Yeah, I make I try to make an effort. You know, when I'm home, I do the damn dishes, man. Take out the trash. All you know, of it. All the stuff that you got to do. Uh, and then I make an effort. Like just here recently, we were in San Antonio. We just it wasn't anything crazy. We did three days. Uh, we'd see, we did Dallas, uh, Houston, and San Antonio. Uh, and it was but it was Easter Sunday, Easter weekend. Yeah. And it's my we, my wife and I have a new uh, three month old daughter, and uh, it was just one of those things. I was like, man, like. I kind of want to be there for Easter. So I booked a flight, didn't tell her anything. I was actually intentionally kind of irritating the shit out of her that night. And she was just like, why is this guy being so short and cold with me? I don't understand. Just knowing that I was going to surprise her the next day. I didn't tell her anything. Next day, you know, she tried to FaceTime me in the morning. and said, I have shitty service. I'm sitting on the plane. I, I can't answer this call. And then I, you know, I got in the Uber and uh, laid back as I was sitting back in the van or something. And, you know, talking to her the whole time, and then probably about a block away, I hung up on her, and she's like, what in the hell's going on with this guy? <laughs> Uber pulls up to the house, and I got out. I was like, it's dad. And it was just like, it's those little things, that 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 effort really helps keep it together. And, of course, it helps that my wife is just, she's a trooper, man. She she gets it. She gets she has my bag, man. She's my, That's good. Yeah. Is she able to travel with you at all? I mean, it's, no. it's hard with, I'm sure you're on one bus. Oh uh, yeah, that's, yeah, man, and it, that's that's what it is. Yeah. That's what it is. It's not it's not meant for the family lifestyle no. unless you have your own yep. your own rig. And even then, I mean, it's just life on the road is tough, man. Yep. And that's the part that people don't really understand. It's not as glamorous as, as people think. No, and you you know it's truck stops and and the back of venues yeah. and dirt parking lots at the back of some crappy bar that smells like <laughs> urine and vomit. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that, I hope you like Wendy's sandwiches, baby, because that's what we're doing. Oh yeah, you're gonna eat a lot of you're it. You need a lot of Wendy's, a lot of Arby's. Yeah, man. Uh, it's just that it's yeah you know, it's just not meant for a family lifestyle. Eventually, you know, we'll get to the point where she can kind of pick and choose where she wants to come. But uh, you know, they were out in Key West. They were supposed to do the Key West thing, and that was the first Old Dominion show that got canceled. Yeah. Shit, we had already bought tickets for the family to go down and stuff. And uh, once we realized that there were any other, there were no other gigs that we could pick up, uh, we just made it kind of an impromptu vacation. Yeah. The whole crew went out there and we just hung out, man. Uh, our uh What's the what's the biggest chart position you've had thus far with your singles? Where have you put uh, that? Country Look Good on you went up to what, 16, 17? Yeah. 16, which is great for a debut single. I mean, uh, obviously we had our fingers crossed it would go all the way, but you never know how these things are going to work. They come right, they, a label coming right behind it with something else? Some movie, yeah, we uh, got a song out right now. It's called Somebody Else's Whiskey, yeah. um, and we just shot a music video for that. Um, it's pretty fun. It's kind of like, you know, it's one of those songs that uh, Frank Rogers had in his phone for he, he probably says about six years yeah and uh he was he, he said it was always intended to be a sad song somebody else's whiskey she drinks somebody else's whiskey now um but after he got to know me he was like man this guy's fun man like, we should make this a fun breakup song and that's sort of the twist that we put on it uh and the video kind of reflects that and, uh, you know the girl takes off right and i just have a one-man party with myself which is yeah. Usually, what happens anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sure you're doing all the station visits and stuff in the mornings as you travel, and yeah. hopping in the car and yeah. making the rounds with the regionals and stuff, man. Yeah. What was really cool, and going back to all the stereotypes when we when we did our first radio tour, uh, my wife and and Oscar's wife Amber, uh, they got together and, and decided they're going to start jarring salsa. That's what they were going to do. They had this whole thing that they were going to go and sell it at farmers markets and stuff. Uh, well, John Loba being the the businessman that he is too, and uh, and Oscar being the I, these these guys get together, man, and I don't know, they make us work ten times harder because they come up with this off the wall shit. But they're just like, why don't we uh, why don't we give jars of salsa to the record la- uh, to the radio stations, all the PDs and stuff? So before we know it, what was supposed to start out as a little farmers market thing, and now we're making thousand jars of salsa. <laughs> who the hell do you think is out there grilling all the stuff or roasting all the chilies and, and onions and stuff? There's me and Oscar out there, just like. I never want to see another jalapeno pepper in my life, dude, honestly. Um, but it was one of those things that we did. And so we took salsa, and then we got sponsored with Cantera Negra. Uh, so they gave us a bunch of jars of tequila, uh, uh, bottles of tequila. I think we should take a little break and have a shot of tequila. Let's have Let's do it, I man. I put one in the freezer while ago. So, yeah. Junior, we'll keep it's, talking while Junior's getting us Well, that was sort of the thing. And it was just the funniest thing. I never intended it for it to be that stereotypical, but shit, man. And we were out on a radio tour, and it was like, hey, you guys like the vibe that we got going on? How about some tequila and salsa for the road as well? And they're just like, man, this guy's 
checking all the boxes, man. It was pretty oh, cool. Yeah. But I think because of that, those those fine little personal touches really helped us build a really great relationship with country radio. And uh, so they've really kind of you know stepped up. And, and with somebody else with you coming out, they they've been on. You know, a lot of them been out of the box ads and stuff. It's been really cool. Where's your uh, Where's your toughest market at? Right now that you know, I'm sure you're watching the charts and stuff all the time, too. And they're they're kind of identifying those areas that you have to go in and hit a little bit harder and make those relationships with. We all have them. Yeah. I mean, I couldn't I'd probably If I had to take a guess, I'd probably say maybe the north, northeast Me too. is probably the toughest right now. You know, the west coast is all stuff. It's pretty easy because yep. it's more identifiable. Um, and, you know, obviously around our, our town, Texas, New Mexico, all that stuff works really well. Yeah. Uh, down here in Nashville, people are consuming. It's all good. Uh, I think we just need to make some, some more efforts to – to travel up north and, and get those people familiar with what we're doing. It's a it's always been a difficult place for me too. And you know, we kinda hit and miss, you know. And we used to we used to play in, you know, Long Island and, and there's some festivals up there, but you know, it's uh it's just it's different. It's a different different mentality. You get above Boston, man, everything changes. Yeah, and I think a lot of it is also familiarity, right? Yeah. You gotta just you gotta do it out I mean, you gotta do it. I haven't had the social media viral moment, right? Um and and I I kinda dig that that it hasn't happened yet for me because I don't the people that have followed my journey know that, man, we're, we are road, we're seasoned, yeah. right? We, we know how to put on a show. We know how to play. We know how to do the damn thing. Uh, we're no stranger to playing the dive bars, and now we're no stranger to playing the arenas. Like, it's one of those things, and, and, and you know, going out there and playing these shows, if, 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 if they've never heard you before in their life, our, my goal is always to put together a show that they're not going to forget, and yeah. that's how we gain the fans, one by one, man, one by one, just, you know, Put miles on the road, man. Yes, sir. Let's go. Uh, All right. You ready to speak a little Spanish, bro? Teach me. We do this. It's a little. It's a little four-part toast. You guys. Okay. Got to join in. We do this at the beginning of every show, and this is what gets a party. This will get the party going. If, if you show up to a Frank Ray show, and we start out the show with this, and you're like, "Oh shit, we're in for a party." So it goes like this. Y'all ready? Yep. Ready. All right. It goes like this. Para arriba. Para arriba. Pa abajo. Pa abajo. Pa el centro. Pa centro. Y pa dentro. Y pa dentro. Very damn good. Mm. Oh. oh, yeah. It's good, right? That's good. Smooth. Ooh, that's good. Yeah, it's all yours, too, man. I like that. It won't last long. We, <laughs> we leave tomorrow for Texas. Yeah, there you go, man. <laughs> we're actually playing Laredo, I think. Oh, yeah, no Laredo. We're in Laredo In, in, in a Saturday. couple days. That's yeah. that's where you're from, right? Yeah, yeah. You got yeah. family there? I do have family there still, yeah. Let's, uh, I'll, uh, let's swap numbers. And, uh, Absolutely, well, if you got man. got some family that come out and see us, I'll put them on the guest list. Oh, yeah, awesome. man. That'd be great. I'd love that. Yeah, they'd love to do that. That's, that's really cool, man. Thank you for, for doing that. Absolutely. Sure. Yeah, Laredo's crazy, man. It was just a, a crazy place to grow up. You know, it's also really close to the border. And so, I mean, I've always been close to border towns. I don't know yeah. what it is. I guess that's why it's so easy for me to have that influence and have that that mix, right? It's it's it's, it's nothing that's – it's not a gimmick, right? It's just authentic. Yeah. It's what it is, and I think that's what people pick up on. And I think when you get in those areas, they know if you're genuine about what you're doing. Man. Oh, yeah. Do you know Nano that used to be running Villa Real? Nano no, in McAllen, know. Texas. Oh, no, uh, no, he's no. A, he's a promoter, had several venues down there. I'm sure you're going to work sure, with I'm sure you probably but heard of the name. Nano? Oscar. Uh, yeah, Nano. He owned Villa Real down in McAllen. Well, let's go, Nano. Come on, man. Uh, we but we've gigs, we've done lots. I was I was like the first artist to open it up in the early nineties, I believe, and then I closed. Then I was the last artist when it closed for renovation. Then I was the, I think I opened the new venue up, yeah. and then when he closed it down for the last time, I was like the last artist that was there. We've had a great relationship. Oh, that's cool, man. It's a great place, and man. Jojo and Patrick down at the yeah, place, I, know I know Jojo. Yeah, yeah, I know Jojo. All yeah. my buddies, man. No yeah. kidding, man. That's awesome. Sure. It was so funny. I was uh, talking about places you played. I was uh, on the way over here, and I, I called my friend Jeff Barry. He used to work on the road with us, and and uh, I said, "Guess who I'm on? You know who I'm going to go hang out with right now?" He goes, "Who is that? Tracy fucking Lawrence." <laughs> he said, "What, dude?" And I, I, he uh, worked down in El Paso for a while, but he talks. He he would always tell stories about man. Tracy came down and played at the Stampede down here, and I was like, "Stampede?" Oh, yeah. man, I don't think it was around whenever I started playing. Uh, anymore, but that's that little metal building, isn't it? It was in El Paso, where all the wild donkeys used to gather up out in the gravel parking lot right behind it. Well, I'm sure it's a strip club now. <laughs> <laughs> Still wild donkeys, everyone. So, so I mean, I mean, I'm glad I just remembered this. So Rick Trevino and I used to do a lot of shows together, and, and I think he kind of got out of the business. I, I saw him down at a place in, in Houston several years ago, but he he made the first time I ever had menudo. His mama made me menudo. <laughs> Can you tell me what the hell's in menudo? Man, it's, 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 it's <laughs> do I. I really want to know is it kind of like uh like like cajun food sometimes it's best not to know yeah it's, it's, i mean it's pork <laughs> right but it's like pork it's like pork fat almost right Chavita? 
in Manula. It's like a pork fat. It's, it's not every. It's like not everyone's cup of tea. It's Slightly. very. It's very slimy. Yeah, stomach yeah. lining. He's a <laughs> stomach lining. That's yeah. why I just want to know because I don't. I don't think I liked it that much. <laughs> yeah, no. But if you have pozole, pozole is kind of the same variation of that. So uh, pozole and manula are both just red chili stews, or you can make them any with, with whatever chili. You can do a, yeah. a green chili or whatever. You can make it clear. But you basically just have a broth, hominy, and and the meat, and then you can, you know. Garnish it up with some cabbage or onions and some lime, and yeah. it's comfort food for us, right? Gotcha. Uh, my wife actually just made a bowl of pozole uh, because, man, that's one thing that I really miss from New Mexico is the, the, the chili. And so my dad came up, my my father in law came up, and I, I tasked them both with bringing some stuff. I, I told my dad, "Hey, I want you to go down to Palomas. Chihuahua is, is the town that's uh, south of Columbus. Uh, my dad still lives in Columbus." And so I said, I need you to go down there and get me a bunch of Doña Maria tortillas, right? The best flour tortillas I've ever had in my life. I said, he said, How? Yeah, I said you're flying over here. Just pack a suitcase full of them and bring them over here. And that's what he did, man. Uh, he, he took a carry-on of tortillas and he brought them over here. And then my father-in-law drove up with sacks of red chili, man. Like, and 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 my wife is, you know, my wife is my, my my wife is white, man. But you'd think she's Mexican by her cooking at this point, man. She's she's got dialed in. But it's a way for us to kind of keep the New Mexico tradition. I love the culture, man. I've been it's immersed great. in it. For, it's great. The food, the people, man. It's yeah. just it's a wonderful thing, man. It really is, man. A lot man. of good people. Yeah, man. And that's that's the thing, man. We just like to party and have a good time. And I mean, shit. Uh, that's it. You have to, man. Life's too short not to. Exactly. Uh, let's uh, let's talk about social media and how relevant all that is for you as you get into your career because none of that stuff was there when my era started, and I'm adapting to it with things like this. Yeah. You know, I didn't didn't like the cheesy stuff in you know, a lot of the platforms. That, that, yeah. And I and I'm not a guy that wants to do something every day. I don't feel like I got to post this. That's not. I, I just I can't do that. I can't regiment. What? How, how do you approach social media? How how's the label directing you? I mean, what what do you do? About the same way, man. About the same way. If I'm being entirely honest, I'm just like you in that sense where I don't like to be pressured to to follow trends. And yeah. stuff like that, man. I, I I just can't stand it, man. Maybe that's a thirty year old, a thirty six year old me talking. But I was just like, I I just don't want to do that. Um, uh, but I I do have my own sense of humor. I do have my own sense of creativity, and so yeah. I try to get these trends and sometimes shit on them. Be like, this is how I'm going to do this. And I just posted one the other day. You see that trend that everyone they're sitting in the car with their wife or their mother or whoever it is, I'm going to show them the song for the first time. No one damn well, they've heard that song a hundred times, oh, man. Yeah. You know it. So I did that with my wife, and I <laughs> show her somebody else's whiskey. When she heard that song the minute I was done with the demo, man. <laughs> and so I put it on, and we did this little skit, and she just turns it off immediately. She said, what the hell are you doing, man? Holding the crying baby in her hand. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I'm going to show you the song for the first time. It's for, it's for TikTok, for content and stuff. She was like, I have shit to do, Frank. And she left. I don't got time for this. That's it. That's pretty much it. And so little things like that that I like to just put my own little spin on it, uh, you know, singing the song. A lot of people want you to sing the song. And just It doesn't matter. You got to have that. That You got to feed the algorithm. You got to do this whole thing. And I was just like, if you want me to sing the song in the middle of downtown San Antonio at the Riverwalk, cool, well, I'll do that. I told one of my bandmates, hey, while I'm doing this, I want you to walk behind me and tell me to shut up. And uh, he did just that. So you really get like nine seconds of <laughs> what was supposed to be the viral moment. But, uh, it was, you know, surprisingly enough, because it's authentic, because it's me, it's, it's humorous and stuff, it, that, that stuff's been connecting with people. And so I think I'll just keep doing that. That's good. Have you – I know you brought a whole bunch of songs over the last two or three years. What's one song that you wrote that you were really, really proud of that you came home and played for your wife and she went, huh? <laughs> You know all of them. No, oh, you know shit. you got one. I got one. My wife make me so mad. I said, I ain't never playing you anything again. Oh man. <laughs> oh gosh. Let's see. Uh, there was a song. Uh, what the hell was it? Uh, I want to say it might have been late. Right, late was. It's on the EP as well, but it's uh, it's a song basically just about hey, you know, if you're. She was always late to everything. Right, she's yeah. late to you know prom. She was late to our wedding. You know. Now the baby's coming, and she's going to be late, too, just like her mama. That was sort of the thing. And she thought it was sweet, but she was just like, it's eh. good. I really like it. I'm like, that's it? I thought it's a smash, right? That's the thing. Hurts your feelings, it's, don't it's it? It's a hit, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but there are those songs, I think, the my wife, she just, you know, she, she, uh, she. Careful. She, yeah, I Careful. know, right? Careful. Let's, let's think about this, right? Let's think about that. I am thinking about it. No, I think <laughs> she's less interested in, in what I'm doing musically and more what I'm doing as a husband. You know what I mean? Absolutely. So I can show her the best song I've ever heard in my life. She'd be like, that's cool. I but, show her like, music videos. Put your heart and soul into it. Yeah. You think it's really good. And then they're yeah. like, mm. 
Yeah, yeah. She, which is great because I know that if my career crashes and burns, she's going to stick around. Absolutely. Yeah, she's like going to stick around. Uh, and that's sort of the thing. We, we, we just talked about that. She's like, man, I'm here to support you. Like, you could be an accountant for all I care. You can go out, you know, shoveling shit, whatever whatever it is, as long as uh, as long as we're together. That's that's what it is. And so she's not, you know, easily impressed. No, but there is a song that I wrote that didn't make the cut that I'm probably most proud of. It's a song called Watching Me, and I wrote it for my kids. I, I'm a girl dad. I have three girls. I have a 19-year-old. I have a six-year-old, and I have a three-month-old now. All girls, too. I yeah. can't make a boy. I don't know if that says anything about my testosterone levels, but <laughs> I can't seem to make a boy, and I'm done now. After three kids, I'm not going to even try. But uh, but I love that, right? So I, I wrote this song about about them, and, and that's the one song that I showed her that she actually was moved by, and, and it didn't make the album. <laughs> Isn't that weird? <laughs> Isn't that weird? <laughs> it may be the next album. We'll see, man. But I'm really, really proud of that song, and... But for the you know for the most part, if it didn't have anything to do with our lives, she's like, eh, cool. Well, I know you met these guys when you came in, but uh, that's Scott. Scott plays a piano in the band. He's also a video guy. Oh, nice. Derek uh, is a second guitar in the band, and he uh, was actually a studio engineer when I met him. I actually stole him from Sound Emporium, so <laughs> uh, he, he worked on a couple of my album projects. So uh, y'all. I, I, let them ask some pointed questions. Yeah, Let's see what they've on. got. I'm always come interested on, to see what they have to Let's say. Dive Very deep. Curious. Let's dive deep. Man. See how this Let's goes. They were, they were pretty good yesterday. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure. I'm under the gun now. <laughs> uh, um, mess up, Scott. Got you got one. Okay, we'll let you. Oh, all right. Let's so you know, at, at these concerts, there's always police officers everywhere. You know. Yeah. I love having about two beers and going out there and just striking up a conversation with them. Yeah. I love asking them. You know, do you have a story that you just you couldn't wait to get back to the station to tell the guys like, man, these guys ain't gonna believe this shit. Like. They've told me stories where they had to tase three or four of these officers had to tase this guy because he was on PCP. Mm. No, you know, just crazy shit and throwing cars at people. So, get anything crazy like that? Yeah, well, I, shit, I, I can sit here and tell you stories all day. But the, the one that really sticks with me is this one. Uh, he's a mentally ill individual, but we got a call for a guy running around naked in an apartment complex. And I was like, okay, cool. So, I pull up. They don't know the apartment number, they don't know if he lives there. It was just some guy, right? It's streaking. Uh, but I got there, and as I pulled up, I see just stacks of furniture and broken lamps and couches and stuff just thrown out this front door. And I was like, well, that looks like a clue to me. <clears throat> I bet you that's the apartment I need to go to. So I showed up, and I got there, and I waited for a second officer to get there. Brian Gardea was the guy. And uh, I said, I'll take my taser out. You go lethal, and we'll clear this building real quick. It's the minute we walk in, you just hear screaming coming from the kitchen. So you automatically go there. And this guy's sitting there, naked. He's on the floor, and there's just piss and blood and shit everywhere. He's just sitting down, leaned up against the kitchen counter. And he's, uh, he's got a, a, a butter knife and a spoon in his hand, right? And I'm giving him commands. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. And he goes like this, right? And he just starts screaming. I'm just, he's kind of like squirming all over the place. And I said, man, I'm about to tase you. Let me see your hands. And he pulls the hands up. And I said, what the hell? Houdini happened, man. Like, what happened to the spoon and the knife? So he tries to get up. I hit him with the taser. I roll him over. And as I roll him over, you see other ends of utensils sticking out of his ass just like this, right? Oh, my God. Gaping, brother. Like, it was, I, I it took me a minute. The taser's running. And I was just like, oh, God. And the taser ran out. Only, you, only get, you only get a five-second ride. So I had to hit him again. And I get up there, and I'm, I'm trying, <laughs> trying to get cuffs on him. And finally, finally do the thing, get cuffs on him. He's, he's down on his stomach, and I'm trying hard. I was like, man, if you lean over, you roll over or something, it's going to be about, it's gonna be worse than this taser, man. It should be bad enough at this point. But uh, I finally get cuffs on him and stuff and call, call the bus, and they, they come, and they put him on the gurney face down. So if I look down after all that's done, and look down, my glove is ripped from here to oh. here. And I got this guy's shit and blood and everything just soaking into my hand. It kind of bubbled up in the glove, like pulled into the glove. And I just like, and I, I, I can handle go. some stuff. But I was right next to the kitchen sink, so I just turned over and started throwing chunks, man. Just like, oh, God. And Brian's laughing at me like, ha, ha, ha. You know, it was just a crazy thing. Um, so finally, anyway, we got, I got cleaned up and walked out of the apartment. And uh, Sergeant Barreto was my supervisor at the time. And he comes up and he goes, he looks at me, looks at my hand. He's just like, why don't you go home, man? <laughs> why don't you go home and run a bath, put some bleach in that motherfucker? <laughs> That's what you got to do. Things like that, man. It's just it was a constant, just 
Oh my god! And, and it was a whirlwind. You people can, are strange. People are weird. There's some. Yeah. There's some jacked up individuals. Oh out there. yeah, man. There yeah, really are, man. Yeah, yeah. But that's sort of the thing that we're talking about. People don't know it unless you tell stories like that. And you can get cops and just sit and just you know tell war stories all day long, man. And you just be like, oh, I get it. And I tell Oscar things like that. I mean, he was he would send me a text or whatever midday, and he has a beer and he's at Twin Peaks or something. And he's just like, hey, cheers, and I send him a. A screenshot of what was on my lapel camera at the time of surrounding call out all the guns out and this and that and i and he was like how's it going bro and i said pretty good how's it going with you like check this out. <laughs> check this out he's like oh man and as a manager he was thinking man i gotta get this guy out of this gig man this is this is too much but it's just a constant roller coaster of calls that you're dealing with that it can go for something like that and then before you know it, you go to the next call you get dusted off and go and take a stolen garden hose report or something that's just crazy man yeah. Uh, let's see. I, I'm very curious now, Scott. Well, yeah, I was just noticing your sense of humor, just in general. <laughs> yeah. Was that something that, that you developed? I mean, you seem to find the, the funny side or the, the lighter side of everything. Does that help you keep an even keel? Is that something that kind of developed over time? Have you always been funny, or is this something like it, wait, it's really cool? The way yeah, you- I think I've always been a bit of a class clown, uh, but even more so in briefing, uh, my buddy, who's retired now, but he was a lieutenant with the police department. He was my direct supervisor. Shane Briscoe was his name. Um, but there were times, I can't even tell you how many times he kicked me out of briefing. 6.30 in the morning, nobody wants to hear this shit. Like, you're just waking up, you're getting started with your day, you have, haven't had a cup of coffee yet, and I'm just in there like, blah, 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 and they're just like, Frank, go 10-8, man. Just get the hell out of here. Like, please just leave. And I'm, seriously? Yeah, yeah seriously. Go, you're too much. A little ray of sunshine, right? And I, I don't. We'll use that Frank Ray of sunshine. <laughs> Frank Ray uh, of sunshine. But, <laughs> but yeah, but but more so in law enforcement. I'm not a big guy, right? I, uh, you know, I was never an intimidating cop. I didn't walk into a room. And people thought oh, this guy's gonna kick my ass, right? There's nothing like that. And so I, I learned how to use this, right? It's uh, silver tongue, man. Let's go. But you learn how to talk your way out of really hairy situations, and. Yeah. Um, and that's pretty much it, man. I remember this one time I was in the uh, I was uh, in the alleyway about to hook this guy up for possession of meth, and he sizes me up. I'm the only one there. This is worse because I I'm I'm on a bicycle at this point. I was doing a bicycle <laughs> cop thing, right? I, again, if I didn't look intimidating already, I looked even worse, man. Have a bell on it? <laughs> yeah, man. I just I <laughs> did. It had a little siren. Bad, you go, whoop, whoop, whoop. But it was like the weakest thing. I just Daisy Deuce. I look like Lieutenant Dangle, man. From and, little, and them little tight shorts. Oh, oh buddy, yeah. buddy. Yeah. Yeah, it was just bad, right? So I knew, and this guy knew he could probably kick my ass, right? Um, he was a big boy, about two hundred fifty pounds, uh, which on meth I didn't think was possible. But uh, <laughs> but he was a big boy, and he looked me up and down. And he goes, "All right, man." He's like, "I said you got to turn around, put your hands behind your back." And he's like, "Like like hell, I'm gonna do that." I okay, cool, man. Listen, we can scrap brother like th- we can do it this way honestly but before you come at me i see he's about 15 feet away i said before you come at me i said i don't know i'll catch you so don't even try to run you're you're a big boy all right i'll catch you um but before you come at me i'm gonna hit this little red button right here you see that and this little red button's gonna call every cop in the city and they know where i'm at dispatch knows where i'm at and i said and you're gonna get the shit beat out of you and i said and then when you finally get hooked up we're gonna take you to the hospital the nurses there are good friends of mine. They will not sedate you, and they will shove a huge tube down your penis, right, <laughs> as a catheter. I said, and after that, you're going to be there for a good 72 hours, and you're still going to go to jail. So how do you want to do this, man? Do you want to turn around put your hands behind your back, or do you want to do this the hard way? And he goes, thinks about it for a little bit. He's like, all right, man, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. The worst part is that I'm, I'm taking him and my bicycle and <laughs> just walking down <laughs> Calling for another unit. Can I get a car over here? Because <laughs> I need to put this guy in there, man. But it's little things like that where I'm just like, that could have been a really bad day oh, yeah. for yeah. both of us, you know. But uh, luckily, it worked out. You kind of learn how to how to walk your way out of that. Well, walk your way out of that I'm uh, I'm glad that you made the transition into Thanks, the music industry. Yeah, and uh, I'm honored to have a chance to sit down and get to know you a little bit better. Yeah, the honor's and, mine, brother. And I hope our paths continue to cross for many, many years. Yeah, me uh, too. Tell me all your socials and everything. Yeah, man. Uh, everyone can find me at Frank Ray Music, social media, and TikTok, and FarmersOnly.com. You can find me there too. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. They're going to look at my shirt and my pants and say, that boy is not a farmer. <laughs> that guy is not a farmer. Uh, but, yeah, man, we got all the stuff out there, YouTube, the whole nine, man. Uh, 
I also got to say, I've been looking at this flag forever, man, but I appreciate everything you're doing and representing and, and sticking up for first responders. That's a really good thing, man. Yes, it is. You know, we, like I said, you know, people probably tuned out. If they tuned out, uh, they, you know, we're doing this whole campaign called Fray for first responders, and they can go out there and frayoc.org and find some help out there. We're really trying to ring that bell and, and raise awareness for that. And, uh, and we just got a lot of music coming their way, man. We're, we're hoping awesome. to drop the album later on this summer. Uh, and, and to that point, we got to, I know Jelly Roll was on here yep. the first time. And if you're listening, Jelly, like, you got to get on that song, man. Get on it. <laughs> Do the song. I wrote a song with Jelly specifically in mind called Bad Boys, and we used that sample of Bad Boys, Bad Boys, what you going to do? And it's really cool, man. I thought it was really awesome to write a song that had this chorus that um, was sort of a, a – you know, uh, malleable for both worlds, right? And so the first verse is from the cop's perspective. Second verse is from, you know, the, the, the street perspective. That's cool. And But yeah. the chorus works with, with both of them, right? And we're so, so Jelly and I being from two different worlds, right? We talk about the law enforcement stuff and this and that, but I have nothing but respect for people like Jelly, right? They went through it, man. They, yeah. You know, you got to make some life decisions and stuff, you know, and, and, you know, whichever path you go through, at the end of the day, you're still a human being, right? And so that song, I think, really highlights that. And we're trying to get Jelly on the line with that. And, and because he was on this podcast and he's a big fan of yours, yeah. we got to... We gotta put some pressure on you, boy. I'll, get, I'll on on. I'll, get on that song. Get on that song, dude. It's a good song, man, and I think it'd be really cool. Uh, not only for the for the state that we find ourselves in, but for country music, it'd be really, really cool, man. Brother, much, much good success to you. Appreciate you, brother. And uh, take care of yourself, partner. Let's go. Let's do some more shots. Right, great. Right. <laughs>